You know the story. A massive, hyped-up launch that, well, doesn't quite hit the mark. It happens to the best of them, right? Even the biggest names in tech don't always nail it on the first try. But sometimes, what comes next is the real story. And today, we're going to talk about OpenAI's big do-over with ChatGPT. So here's what we're going to cover. First, we'll take a quick look back at the uh, less-than-stellar debut of GPT-5. Then, we'll get to know its much warmer successor, GPT-5.1. From there, we'll dive into the big push for personalization, figure out why OpenAI made this change so suddenly, and then wrap things up by asking some pretty big questions about our relationship with AI. Okay, so let's jump in the time machine for a second and go back to August. The AI world was absolutely buzzing, just waiting for GPT-5. It was supposed to be the next huge leap forward, the thing that changed the game all over again. And then, it dropped. And the reaction was, to put it nicely, a collective meh. For all the hype, a lot of people just weren't seeing the revolutionary improvements in things like math or even creative writing. It just kind of fell flat. And listen, this wasn't just a few people complaining on social media. The feedback was so not great that OpenAI actually had to bring back the older GPT-40 just a day later. Ouch. Even their number one partner, Microsoft, started cozying up to competitors like Anthropic. Yeah, when your biggest investor starts window shopping, you know you've got a problem. All of that brings us to what happened next. And to their credit, OpenAI didn't just try to put a band-aid on it. Nope. They came back with a whole new version number, which in the tech world is basically a giant sign that says, OK, OK, we're fixing it. And here it is, GPT 5.1. The mission statement is super clear. This time, it's not just about raw brain power. They're trying to upgrade the EQ along with the IQ. The goal is to make it not just smarter, but, you know, just better to talk to. And their approach is pretty clever. They've split it into two modes. Think of GPT 5.1 Instant as your quick-witted assistant for the simple stuff. Then you've got GPT 5.1 Thinking, which is like the deep-thinking philosopher for the really tough problems. But the best part is, this time, the philosopher learned how to explain things in plain English. But here's the kicker, you don't even have to choose between them. They've rolled out this auto mode that basically reads the room. It figures out if you need a quick answer or a deep dive and just handles it. Pretty seamless. But honestly, the performance boosts aren't even the biggest part of the story here. The real theme of this whole update is making ChatGPT feel less like a generic tool and a lot more like your tool. And this table just says it all. They've completely revamped the personality presets. The vague listener is now the much more approachable, friendly. The cold robot is now the much more useful, efficient. And for all my fellow geeks and skeptics out there, don't worry, nerdy and cynical are here to stay, untouched. Thank goodness. And this expands into a whole menu of personalities you can pick from now. You can set it to professional to draft that serious email, then switch it over to quirky to brainstorm. Or hey, maybe you need that cynical voice to tell you why your brilliant idea might not be so brilliant. The point is, you're finally in the driver's seat. And this quote from Fiji Simo at OpenAI really nails why this is happening. This isn't just a fun little feature. When you have this many people using your product, it becomes a total necessity. So that begs the question, why this huge pivot to personality and warmth all of a sudden? It's about more than just fixing a bad launch. It's really about adapting to a whole new reality. This number, this is pretty much the entire reason. 800 million active users. Just let that number sink in. That's more than twice the population of the United States. It's a staggering number that completely changes what a product like this needs to be. Because, I mean, think about it. At that kind of scale, a single default robot voice is just broken. It can't work. What sounds right to a programmer in California might sound completely wrong to a student in Seoul or a writer in Berlin. Personalization isn't a feature anymore. It's a requirement. Okay, but as these AIs get more personal, more human, well, that's where things get a lot more complicated. It kind of opens up a whole new can of worms, philosophically speaking. Which leads us to the million dollar question. Is there a line here? I mean, as these things get better and better at acting like us, we have to start thinking about where a helpful tool ends and an unhealthy attachment begins. Now, to be fair, OpenAI knows this is a big deal. They're on the record about it. Fijisimo has said they have to be vigilant about this, and that they're really trying to figure out what a healthy relationship with an AI even looks like. And here's their game plan for tackling it. First, just admit the problem exists. Be vigilant. Second, talk to the experts, the psychologists, the sociologists, to figure this out. And third, 
Don't just spring massive changes on everyone at once. Roll it out slowly and let people adjust. So if you zoom out, the big takeaway is this. ChatGPT is kind of changing its job description. It's evolving from being a simple tool, like a calculator, into something that's designed to be a constant, personalized companion in our lives. And that leaves us with a pretty fascinating, and honestly, a really important question to think about. As these AI systems get warmer and smarter and more tailored to you, where do we draw the line? What's the real difference between a helpful assistant and a friend? That's something we're all going to have to figure out together. Thanks for watching. Before your Wi Fi drops, hit that like, share, and subscribe button. Stay sharp, stay curious, and keep guarding the trends.